Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. So we're taking a running start this morning, looking a little bit at 1 Corinthians 1, 18. Not too much, though. I know Pastor Fleming covered this last week, but this is a good place to start. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? As we hear those three points, uh, it's important to recognize, of course, who, who are the ones who believe that they are wise. Uh, that would be the sophists, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Where is the scribe? This word for scribe, grammates, uh, is actually not referring to anyone in Greek or Roman society, but directed at the Jews and the, the Pharisees, really. And then where is the debater of this age? Uh, so that, again, addresses the Corinthian uh, context. What is, is somewhat interesting to note is that there, there are some underlying things here as well from Isaiah, uh, where Paul is kind of quoting from here. Um, and in his context, the one who is wise, that's referring all the way back to uh, Egypt, to those uh, counselors of Pharaoh. Those were the ones who were considered to be wise during that time. And now, if you think about that uh, as in context of the plagues, right? It, they get to a certain point in the plagues where, where they're like, hey, Pharaoh, this is, this is not something we can replicate. This is by the finger of God. Uh, so their wisdom is proved to be folly in the end. Okay, so that's just kind of an interesting textual note there. Uh, verse 21, for since in... The wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Paul's going to be really expanding on this in chapter 2 as he delves into the matter of what is revealed by the work of the Holy Spirit. That there's a knowledge here that has been hidden from the foundation of the world that is being revealed through the scriptures by the work of the Holy Spirit. And so this is not then a knowledge that can be obtained through your study of the world. Instead, it's a preached knowledge. And that brings salvation. It not only brings salvation, it gives faith itself so that we may believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. Yes, we know about the Jews who were demanding signs. We remember that from the Gospels, right? Jesus would do all sorts of signs, such as the feeding of the 4,000, and yet still after that, the Pharisees would demand proof that he is authorized to preach what he is preaching. And in the end, the only sign that Jesus says he's going to give them is the sign of Jonah, which is his resurrection from the dead. They weren't willing to accept the signs along the way that revealed who he was. For example, remember the disciples on the boat in the stormy sea who realized that this is more than God, for G or more, more than man, for Jesus is doing things that only God can do. Greeks seek wisdom. That is the, pro the other issue that, that Paul here is addressing. We preach Christ crucified, that stumbling block, the scandal to the Jews and folly to Gentiles. And I went into this a little bit in a sermon uh, two weeks ago because the, the Jews themselves, when they were looking at the Christ, were expecting something far different. Uh, it, it, would, it would kind of like, it would be kind of like um, the, the women's national soccer team saying, you should praise us because we're going to go off and lose all of our games. Well, th that's not the reason you're rooting for them, right? You're rooting for them because you think they're going to win. You're rooting for them because, well, you're part of the United States of America. We're the greatest soccer country on earth. That's not true. We're terrible at soccer. <laughs> Other places are way better at soccer, football, than we are. 
Okay? Um, but, but the Jews are expecting, expecting a spectacular Christ, a powerful Christ, a Messiah who is going to come in and destroy all the foes, which of course he does, but not in the expected way. He does through, so through death, through crucifixion, through humbling himself for you, emptying himself for you. Folly to the Gentiles, because again, <laughs> going back to that analogy, right, the women's soccer team, this is not the way a ruler should behave, sacrificing himself for the sake of his people. But to those, the ones called the Kletos, um, so to you, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now this is the third time that Paul has mentioned election, Kletos, or calling. Okay? This, this is something that's rather important in this first chapter because it's establishing how we are within this kingdom, how we are citizens within God's household, how, in fact, we're not just citizens, but we are his children. This is security. This is certainty. This is comfort for our sake. And it doesn't matter what your nationality happens to be, Jew or Greek or Sudan, or American, or Canadian, or Australian, or, well, Ukrainian or Russian. Your citizenship here on earth is not what secures salvation. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Verse 26. Consider your calling, your clasis. Now the fourth time that Paul is mentioning calling. Not many of you were wise according to worldly stands, not m standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of Eugene. Eugenesis. Isn't that great? What a good name to name a child. If you have a boy someday, you're like, what am I going to call you? Eugene, the one of noble birth. Yeah. <laughs> now, they're going to be made fun of by everybody else, but you're like, what a great name this is. Okay? Um, so... Uh, not many of you are of noble birth. Now, it, Paul doesn't here say not any of you. So, so don't get confused here. There are people who, by worldly standards, are wise and powerful and of noble birth. The church, during Paul's time, is made up of more than slaves and freedmen. And it, in fact, encompasses uh, all sorts of uh, stratums of society. So you have multiple layers of people all involved in this church, and that is where we see some of the problems, as uh, Jack noted a couple of weeks ago, because those who are wealthy who don't have to work are coming to the Lord's Supper early and eating all the stuff, and those who come later who have to work are not receiving anything. Okay? So, regardless of what your position happens to be in life. Verse 27, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. Uh, humble or humiliate here. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God except boasting in Christ, right? So we're not going to stand before God boasting in all of the good works that we have done, all of the things that we have achieved. Like, look how, uh, you, you see my transcript here from Concordia Seminary that lists all of the A's or B's or C, whatever you're proud in, right? Okay, look at this. I've got a solid 3.97. God isn't that impressive? Nope. <laughs> okay. Well, look at the building that I built. It's unique in its style. It's amazing. Nope. Look at all the things that I've accomplished. No. How do we stand before God? In Christ. The one who put off strength and took on weakness, who put off majesty and was low and despised in the world, who did what none of us can do, was incarnate 
by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary. Something that is nothing. You cannot have life in just an egg. You must have egg and sperm. They must connect. Except God does what we cannot do. Creating life where there would be none. Even creating life within your dusty hearts so that you would bear fruit in this life. So God does all of this. Jesus takes on our flesh so that we may go into the presence of God and boast in him. Verse 30, because of him you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that it, as it's written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So, we boast in the Lord because in the end, we owe all things unto him. This body the gifts that we've been given, all him. Faith given to you. Life and salvation and forgiveness given to you. Christ given to you. This is what we boast in. Now, Jesus is our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Right there in verse 30. Righteousness, uh, I think we're well steeped in that matter, right? Right? Uh, Christ, who is the righteous branch, Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 to 6, is our righteousness given unto us so that we may live in righteousness and purity before God. Second article of the Apostles' Creed explanation, right? But what about this matter of sanctification? Well, here the word is hagiosmos, which means holiness, we're living a holy life. Well, where does that holy life come from? So is it a matter of what you have done? Like how you've lived such a great life and you've obeyed everything that your parents and teachers have ever told you to do, right? You're like, no. <laughs> no, where does that holiness come from? That comes from God. That sanctification comes from God. Now, what do we do? We live in Christ's righteousness and his holiness. And we continue to receive that righteousness and holiness from him as we live in it. This then begins to make sense of the, the trio here, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Okay? Because initially you could you could look at this and say, well, this is this something that's proceeding logically like but one to the next. Like, I have righteousness, and then I have sanctification. But wait a minute. It all happens because of redemption. Because of blood that was shed for your sake. That purchased and won you. That cleanses you. There is no eternal salvation without a sacrifice. Because there's no forgiveness without blood. Thanks for mentioning that in your sermon, by the way. Yeah. It's great. It's great. So all three of these go together. Uh, the word for redemption there is apolutrosis. Uh, that has to do with sacrifice, a redeeming sacrifice. Going into chapter 2, proclaiming Christ crucified. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not proclaim to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Um, I should have done a little more research here because I can't figure out uh, how the ESV uh, has taken the phrase to musterion to theu and completely eliminated it. He's ta Paul is talking here about um, proclaiming the mystery of God. Okay, And that's completely lacking in the ESV. Uh, those of you with the NKJV, so the Bible you may have picked up when you came into the, to the room. How does verse 1 read? I can give you NASB. Oh, just a minute. Uh, go ahead in the back there. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellent speech or wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Okay, so there the mystery is being translated as testimony. Okay? Yep. 
And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. Okay. And then I, I see um, in the footnote here, some manuscripts, mystery or secret, uh, which is actually what the Nestle Allen has chosen to include as, as uh, the dominant reading, the mystery of God. Now, the reason I'd advocate for the, the mystery of God as opposed to the testimony is that this becomes a primary issue in the rest of chapter 2. You're going to hear it again. Okay, so maybe in, in your own Bible, then you just circle either the footnote or you write in the margin mystery because Paul is going to address mystery again in the letter here to the Corinthians. And what is this mystery? Now here it, it appears that Paul is going to go into some type of hidden knowledge that's revealed, which in a later generation, the Gnostics would love. Gnostics love secret knowledge. They're like, yeah. We're all over this stuff, stuff that you can only get by practicing our method and going into our ways. But this is not what Paul is going to be addressing here. He's got something else going on. Verse 2, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Uh, Paul here emphasizes the core of the Christian church, Christ crucified for sinners. This is our proclamation. This is the church's most essential work. If we do not have this, if we're not preaching Christ crucified, then we are not focused on our primary work. Look at Matthew chapter 28. What's the church supposed to do? Go forth, baptizing, making disciples of all nations, and teaching that which Christ has entrusted us with. If we're not doing that, we're not doing the work of the church. So if, if, if there are other things that become elevated within the church, okay, uh, let's say we, we become primarily focused uh, or only focused on uh, doing um, works of mercy, uh, serving our neighbor uh, here, and we fail to preach the gospel, then we are no longer doing that which Christ has called us to do. Should we do works of mercy? Should the church be out there feeding the hungry, clothing the needy, caring for the, the homeless, the widow, the orphan? Yes. Should we be teaching Christ's word here in our school? Yes. But the chief work, proclaim the gospel. Proclaim Christ. Pastor? Yep. Um, he says in verse 1, uh, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech and wisdom. Yep. And I decided to go out in a different way. Sure. Do you think this is in light of his experience in Athens before he comes to Corinth. There in Athens, there, says, I think there's evidence for that. To make the connection with the, uh, the uh, monument to the unknown Right, God. in the Areopagus. He makes allusions to uh, Greek poetry. Mm -hmm. as, your own, as your own poets say, we are God's children. Mm -hmm. And then, and, um, and then everything just falls flat on the face when he gets to the resurrection. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does, with, with the exception of a couple of folks, right? Um, including one who is an Areopagite, but I don't remember his name. I just read this in the Treasury of Daily Prayer. But I, I think there... What's that? Thank you. Somebody wrote his name in one of the famous series. Got it. Thank you. So I, I think there's basis for that, Jack. I, th I think you're right in that. Um, and, and also related to, to that, what, what does God reveal through, throughout uh, this church in Corinth? Well, all sorts of, of uh, works uh, of power, not only here but elsewhere, uh, healings, uh, conversions, 
Uh, if, if you noted, uh, most recently in the Treasury of Daily Prayer, Acts chapter 19, they were talking about how a group, group of folks had taken $50,000 uh, or 50,000 pieces, uh, books worth 50,000 pieces of silver and burnt them because they were teaching about sorcery, about magic, I guess. Okay. Um, so this, this then is, is what, what's revealing the work of God. Uh, as opposed to Paul having a well-crafted, I think he still does have well-crafted sermons, Jack. Uh, I do think oh, no. that. Um, but that's not necessarily the, the chief focus of this particular letter. He goes on in verse 6, Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. Uh, when, when Paul addresses the mature, he's using the word uh, teleos, and there it's, it's like the ones who are, are um, being perfected or being completed. Now, initially, one may think that's addressing the church in Corinth, though if you go on to chapter 3, he calls the people in Corinth a bunch of babies. So, really? He calls them babies? Yes, yes, actually he does. Um, he calls them infants in Christ. And, and so, uh, one, one then may begin to wonder, uh, who are these folks who are mature, who are teleos? Um, and that is, is the entire formation of the Christian, which we're really getting at in, in this letter. So, in addition to, to that little note, although it's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, that's important. Because what we're going to hear next is about judgment in, in part against the rulers. We impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, it, here, we do have proclamation of this secret and hidden wisdom of God already beginning in Genesis 3.15. That, by the way, is a verse you should have learned by heart, that you should know. It's that verse which proclaims that the seed of woman will crush the serpent's head. So already there's this proclamation in the scriptures of salvation for us. Um, the rulers of the age during Christ's time didn't understand this. Uh, you, you think about that in relationship to the Pharisees. As they, they're looking at Jesus, what do they see? Not the Christ. They do not see him as the Messiah. And in fact, they go on to say that it's better for their nation that he should be crucified than that the whole thing would fall apart. Verse 9, As it's written, what no eye has seen, no, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Uh, notice how God is going about doing, the re doing this proclamation. It's revealing by the Holy Spirit. Think about the Gospels. Is this born out there? Do we hear something similar proclaimed by Jesus about the work of the Holy Spirit? Yes, right? Okay, so it, just as an, an example, uh, think about Peter's proclamation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Okay, that's Matthew chapter 16. What is Jesus' response after that? Blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, son of Jonah, for what? Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. God has. Right? Furthermore, Jesus in the Gospel of John over and over again attaches his spirit to his word. This is how this is being revealed. What? What's being revealed? That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that those who believe in his name have what? Eternal life, citizenship. They're made part of the family. This is what, what's being revealed. 
not some type of hidden knowledge that we must discover, but instead a knowledge contained within the scriptures about who Jesus is for you. Okay. We're going to stop there and pick up with the rest of chapter 2. Um, and, and we'll get to another verse which it's very helpful to remember that the natural man does not accept the things of God for their folly to him. That's verse 14. Okay, So that, that's a good verse to, to just consider as you're out there in the world. It's like, uh, I know people are going to simply disagree with me because it's, it's against the flesh. What I'm speaking about is contrary to sinful flesh. And the flesh fights against it. Okay, before we go, uh, what questions or additional comments do you have? Yes, another seminary student. Excellent. <laughs> I, I'm just curious how the Jews would have had this conception of the Messiah as this warrior, this all powerful. Like, how did they miss it so much? What would they base Well, on? right. So, as you take a look at some of the, the Psalms and other scriptures which talk about how uh, the Christ is going to overthrow enemies, you can come to that conclusion if you're not reading it in concert with Isaiah and the suffering servant of God. Okay? Uh, Jack also has some insight here for us. Well, most people didn't believe in one Messiah. They believed in multiple Messiahs. And the interesting thing to me is if you look at rabbinical literature, they believed in a suffering Messiah. In fact, there's an entire Jewish tradition of, of equating Isaiah 53 with the Messiah, that contrary to what modern Jews believe. But they, had, they could not think of a glorious Messiah also being a suffering Messiah. And that's the interesting thing about the theology of the cross, is not that God isn't this glorious, that Jesus isn't this glorious thing, that God isn't this glorious thing, but, um, but that it's hidden in, under a contrary appearance. So for them, they, they recognized suffering Messiah. Sometimes they called it Ben, there was Ben Joseph, there's Ben David and Ben Joseph. So David, Ben David fights the bad guys and wins. Mm -hmm. Ben Joseph somehow gets sick and dies, or he dies in like the last eschatological fight for Jerusalem or something, you know. So they could, they could, they could see that, but they could, mm. they, could not, they could not see how these could be the same person because they could not see how suffering and glory were reconcilable, and that's the great paradox. So, um, and again, I think that's, that, that, that's very central then to Christian understanding is that uh, glory is hidden under its opposite. So as Luther says, everything, God hides under the form of his opposite, right? And this, of course, you can extend this to baptism in the Lord's Supper and then the Christian life. We, what we look like is a bunch of sinners gathered around word and sacrament, which don't seem like very impressive things, but in fact, it's hidden, there's, it's really, you know, hidden, God's hidden glory working salvation. So the son of Joseph would be like in the line of, of Joseph who suffers in Egypt. Right, I think it's just that he exemplifies Joseph's yep. suffering in Egypt, right? So, right? And then son of David being the one who's exemplified, or yeah. who's glorious. Right. Which, which is great that Jesus is then both the son of Joseph and the son of David. Yeah. Yep. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that to us who are mere children that you've revealed to us the kingdom that you've shown forth your glory through the contrary sign sending your son in the weakness of human flesh in humility to suffer uh, but in doing so he is glorified and he glorifies your name we pray that you would strengthen us through your word and sacrament and allow us to live holy lives in Christ's holiness and righteousness, rejoicing in our redemption. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.